Um, and, and we just can't say enough positive things uh, about her and about her new book, Gather Me, a memoir in praise of the books that saved me, or her. <laughs> um, Lisa and I uh, couldn't believe uh, our good fortune when Glory last year uh, responded to a PNP ad for an opening for marketing director. Uh, we jumped at the chance to hire her, uh, given her years of marketing experience and especially her success in establishing and growing the popular influential online book club, uh, Well Read Black Girl. <laughs> As, um, as head of, of marketing, she's been an enthusiastic and a very creative leader and someone who is well-liked and admired by uh, pretty much uh, all her colleagues. Uh, and now she's written a, a very frank, very moving, and inspirational memoir about her life growing up in Virginia with parents who had emigrated from Nigeria. Uh, and the books she read along the way that helped her cope with challenges, understand herself, and her place in the world and find her own voice. Uh, she's faced some truly difficult times uh, over the years. Uh, when she was young, her father, whom she uh, adored, suddenly moved back to Nigeria after her parents had divorced. She spent much of her childhood caring for her, her two younger brothers, and she coped with her mother's uh, debilitating mental illness. But books, especially books by black authors uh, gave her the comfort, the guidance, and the sense of purpose uh, and belonging to carry on and eventually emerge as the uh, quite strong and dynamic person that she is today. Hers is uh, truly a, a remarkable story, and we're so excited to hear her talk about it today. Um, and uh, here's Lisa too, who has some other introductory remarks. I'm gonna tell you the backstory. Um, no, what uh, I, the book is amazing. I think all anybody who's read it knows that. Um, but I just want to say how I first heard about Glory. So um, it turns out, and I didn't really know this at the time, that Morgan, where are you, Morgan? Morgan, who was one of our fabulous, most missed booksellers ever, um, but worked for PNP, and she had a book club. And um, she invited Glory to come to the book club. And Jen, who is uh, the manager of this store and our Wharf store, um, would sit in on the book club and was there when Glory was there. And she's like, oh my God, who is this woman? We, she's amazing. And she was totally inspired by her. But the problem was, and Jen was thinking, I wonder if she would ever work for PNP, but she lived in New York. So that kind of fell by the wayside until one day Jen was looking in the applications for the store and there was Glory's name and application. And so she went to the managers who were hiring. She said, you've got to hire, this is the, this is the person. Just, you don't need to interview anybody. Now that's, that's, that's one version of what happened. The other version, no, that's what, that did happen. That did happen. But another aspect, I should say not version, another aspect of what happened is that, now those of you who don't know Brad, which is probably most people in the room, except for the people who work here, know that he is extremely hard to please and impress. Am I right? Staff, am I right? Yes, I am right, okay. So Brad, you know, and he interviews everybody who applies to the store. And he came home one night and he said, you are not gonna believe this woman that were, that's applied to be the market. She's amazing. I mean, I can't believe she's gonna work for us. I can't believe she's gonna take the job. I mean, she's so qualified. She's so, uh, she's just extraordinary. Like if you just meet her okay. and I'm like, wait, who is this person? Who, wait, who are you? You know, who are you? Cause I've never heard him talk like that in 30 years. So anyway, that was how I first heard about Glory. And then I didn't actually meet Glory for a while. And then of course, when you meet Glory, you know that you're not only meeting somebody who is deeply compassionate and incredibly smart and deep. Um, but also it turns out when you open the pages of her book, an extraordinary writer. And I really will just leave you with this. I was very lucky and felt very privileged to read a very early, when the, when the book was first out in its galley form, basically. Um, uh, Glory let me read it. And I, I just, I, all I'll say is, it's kind of a spiritual experience to read this book. It's a spiritual experience. It is so deep and so moving, 
And so Rob, without being superficial or prurient, and um, it's a special, special book from a very special person who we love and adore. And we're so proud, to, proud of you, and we're so happy for you. Oh, and the other person that we have to mention, well, her brother Maurice, who's in the book, of course. And then the star attraction, Zeke. Hey, Zeke. Woo! So we got the whole gang here. So anyway, with that uh, very lengthy digression, and sorry to take so long, I just want to yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I haven't forgotten, OK? I don't even know why. This is called it. mansplaining. <laughs> uh, yes. And we are very, very happy that with, uh, with Gloria in conversation tonight is Ayo Tometi, who, um, am I allowed to say that you're maybe working on your own book? Well, I just did. Um, so <laughs> she's thinking about it. She's got a, she's got a concept of a book. Um, um, yeah, better than some other concepts of some other things. Anyway, um, she's a human rights activist and community organizer. She co-founded Black Lives Matter in 2013. Um, she's uh, also worked for eight years as executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, an organization that helps black immigrant communities mobilize and advocate for social and economic justice. That sounds like a whole life's work, too, on top of everything else. Um, and like Lori, she is also uh, the daughter of Nigerian immigrants. So please join us in welcoming Glory and Io to Union Market. <laughs> Hey, y'all. Thank you, thank you. Oh, my goodness. That introduction. I loved that. I love the enthusiasm, the joy, the realness, yes. the respect on your name, <laughs> on your contributions, <laughs> and on your essence. Yeah. So that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for honoring my friend so beautifully. <laughs> can, can I be like real for a second? Yes. I'm actually really nervous. <laughs> yeah. mm. yes. I just see like so many like friends and family and people that I love in one space. And I'm like, I haven't even done anything yet, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to cry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and I just want to say thank you because so many people in this room have supported me, have lifted me up, have just like made me feel seen and loved, and I appreciate everyone in this room. I truly, truly do. So thank you for being here today. And thank you for moderating this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. This is such an honor. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you. I am such a fan of you, your work, your essence, your being, your light. And it's such an honor to be here with you and, and to share this time and conversation publicly with everybody. Um, I'm not sure who's had the chance of reading the book yet, but you all are literally in for such a profound treat. I feel like that's such a, like, it's such a weird word, but like, it's such a moving and important contribution. And I cried at many points reading the book, and I didn't expect to. Mm -hmm. And I've known you for many years, and there were things in there, there were scenes in there, there were experiences that you've um, transcended and passed through that I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And I was so moved by your courage mm -hmm. and your commitment to telling your own story. You. Yeah, really, really important, mm -hmm. really beautifully done. Um, so I know that we have till Eight. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a little wiggle room, but we will use all of our time as uh, efficiently and effectively as possible while having a really deep and meaningful conversation about a very important book. Um, and I will say, everybody should ensure that they do not leave this place without the book. <laughs> I know you know why you're here, but just want to say and reiterate the fact that you're not going to want to miss what uh, Glory has done and said and shared in this book. Um, you, you really laid out some really important things here and you talked about 
some things that were quite traumatic, like capital T trauma that I um, had not, you know, I didn't know that you went through, but you shared in a way and in a format that I think was very unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And as the daughter of Nigerian immigrants, and I'll talk about that a little bit later and some of my other questions, but as somebody who's Nigerian American, mm -hmm. this hyphenated kind of experience, there is a way in which we're oftentimes relegated to one thing or another, but I yeah. felt like you just brought the fullness of your entire experience yeah. to every page, and I'm so grateful for Thank the way you. you did that. Yeah, so I want to start yeah. <laughs> by just asking you, because this is your third book, correct, yeah. right? So yep. amazing. You're not new to this. She ain't new <laughs> to this, right? This is our third. It's amazing. And it's different yeah. from the other two, mm -hmm. right? Quite different. So I'm wondering, first and foremost, like, what do you feel or what was your purpose yeah. in writing this book after... Yeah. So with my, most people are familiar with my first anthology, Well Read Black Girl, you know, finding ourselves, discovering ourselves. Um, and in that question, in that book, I posed the question, when did you first see yourself in literature? So I posed that question to very established writers, Jasmine Ward, Rebecca Walker, um, Tiari Jones, people that I had admired over the years and I had the privilege of interviewing in my book club. And... As I was doing that process, I, I love research. I love like being in connection with people, writing down their words, transcribing things. Um, that was a very exciting, and um, it was like I was felt like I was witnessing something very personal and beautiful. The exchange we had between us, because most people, we there was a huge editing process back and forth. So I got to like revise all my heroes. You know, it feels awkward to say like, yes, I've been able to edit Jacqueline Woodson or Jasmine Ward. Like most people don't have that opportunity, but because they were in my essay collection, I worked very closely with each one of them. So we each have our own relationships and they answer that central question. With this book, I felt like I was answering that question for myself. Like what were all the books that influenced me, that gave me hope, that gave me courage, that at the time I didn't realize they were that impactful, but when I, as I was writing it, I was able to look back and really reflect on these moments that were traumatic or challenging or even joyful and say that like this is why I was able to process this information. This is why I have these very special memories. I like to think of books almost like songs, like you have your favorite one. You know, when you go do karaoke, like my go-to song is Tiny Dancer by Tina Turner, you know, and like <laughs> When I'm feeling really sad, I have a go-to book that I go, to, like I go and like pick out my quote or, you know, like have that special moment where it calms me, it brings me back to center, it just allows me to be myself again. And that space of like looking for direction in books started really early for me. And again, writing this memoir let, let me see those moments and it became very clear as I went back and read my journals and looked through scrapbooks and like I just had all these moments of um, investigating myself and who I was as a young person and how I went through all these moments. And I, and I also want to talk about the, the you know, the, the big T trauma. At the time it was happening, I did not think it was trauma. Right. <laughs> I thought it was just like very normal. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully I've been able to have a lot of therapy and I've been able to, I feel very resolved about all the things that I've encountered in my life and that's why I was able to write this book. But as I was experiencing them, I would not have called it trauma. I would have just, it was just like my life. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking about so many aspects of this book and I was thinking about you and what you've done with Well Read Black Girl. And I mean, can we just, also give her a round of applause. <laughs> Just for, like, wow. Like, such a profound contribution to our people, mm -hmm. our peoples. Yeah. Like, wow. And you just had a phenomenal and very successful yes. festival in New York, from what I gather. And I wasn't able to be there, but I was able to check in online. And I know there were some people in the audience who were there who attended, yes, some speakers and everything. And just you have been so prolific ever since starting Well Bred Black Girl um, with uplifting the voices, the stories, the experiences of others, right? These various authors stewarding their work, stewarding um, 
their presence and their, even the preservation yeah. of their of their work in many ways and gathering people to celebrate their stories yeah. and so on. Just really being a champion for storytellers. And I know as somebody who has done a lot of organizing, helped to support the narratives and you know, oftentimes lesser known narratives or challenging narratives yeah. and giving voice to them, I know that it's tempting mm -hmm. to go to the back yeah. and let ourselves and our stories kind of lie dormant yeah. and not give voice to our own struggles and challenges. And what I was really moved by was how you said to yourself, like, well, from what I see it, yeah. right? Like, you essentially finally said, like, you know what? Like, let me go there. Yeah. Let me go there. Let me share more deeply, more intimately. Yeah. Um, my life and let me lay it bare and it's so vulnerable, yeah. so vulnerable. I how mean, did you find that courage and how did you go through that? I think part of it was I had an experience and, I, and I've told this story before, but it was like a aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. So early in the book club, I had a, a book club member who shall remain nameless who came up to me who basically was like, I have to leave the book club because like you're too happy. <laughs> And I was just like, wait, what does that mean? Like, she just thought I was just too enthusiastic, too upbeat. Like, I always was, like, chipper. And she just felt like it wasn't a realistic thing. Like, you know, the, the idea of posit, posit, um, excuse me, toxic positivity is a real thing. I do not believe I was doing that. Or in, but I just was like, I just have a, you know, a optimistic outlook. Yeah. But what it revealed to me was that I wasn't showing everything. Like my enthusiasm was being uh, mistaken for a mask. It wasn't like something that, uh, and I actually didn't talk a lot about my family or the struggles that I was going through because it didn't feel like something I needed to offer up. But in this you know, format of being you know, open and like witnessing all these different experiences, I just felt like I could be honest with myself. And I also, at the time I started writing this, I had finally like let go of all that shame. Like I did feel a lot of shame around my mother's mental health, um, the circumstances of between my father leaving, uh, just like the the position that we were in life. And none of these things were my fault. They were, you know, what's my family's fault? It's just like the reality of our experience. But there is a level of embarrassment I felt, or just like, you know, because people have an idea of who you are and what you look like and what you do, or even the idea of being Nigerian was always put into question. So as you know, then my name Glory is very popular in Nigeria. You go to Nigeria and say the name Glory, like 30 people will turn around. Like it's just, it's just like, it's like, you know, precious amen, patience, like blessing. It's a very popular name. But in the West, here in the US, it's like, it's like, oh, your name is so special. And it's like, yes and no. Like it's, it's like, it's a very common name in Nigeria. So these ideas of just like who you are and what people, think of you um, and I was really trying to like fight against every perfectionist bone in my body as I was writing this because I felt like if I could put it on the page and be as vulnerable and as raw as possible I could like let everything go fully and start a new chapter and I was just really eager you know to be like okay this I'm feeling like I cry yeah. this is done and I have resolution and I feel confident and I have like a story that I can leave for my family. And this is, I, at the time I was uh, really in the deep writing, I was expecting my son. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there were so many parts of the book that I really, you know, I can't like write to all my, by the memories of my parents, you know, I can't even speak for my brothers all the way. Like I can only write into the gaps and what I do know and what I experienced and how I felt about it. And I tried to do that as much as possible and really be honest about like how I felt. Yeah. Um, because the early iterations my editor give, did give me feedback while well. she's like, well, that's your mom's experience. That's your brother's experience. How did you feel? Mm -hmm. And I had to go back and really interrogate that. Like, well, how was I feeling and how can I be, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as clear as possible? Yeah, yeah. I, I could see that and I could feel that. And I'm glad to see that you were able to do that. And um, it really challenged me, to be quite honest. I you know they mentioned that I'm, you know, working or thinking through a book, and in reading yours, 
I was really challenged by like, hey, there are things that aren't pretty or fit into a narrative of our lives or a version of our public, you know, our public persona um, that folks might be okay with or are know or well known, but there are these other facets of our, our being yeah. that are equally as important. And what I took away even with some of the book was just that while we know you and your work and the amplification of other people's books, there's just so much more wisdom mm. that you have Aww. to share, so many gems, so many beautiful um, insights, and just, oh it was, there was so much you were able to offer. That and just so kind. I do not feel that way, but yes. <laughs> like, I think that's so beautiful. I just feel like my, I, I definitely write for catharsis. You know, like, that is what I'm doing. I was at the National Book Festival um, this past August, mm -hmm. and I witnessed an incredible author who, her scholarship, her writing is so, like, so beautiful and precise, and I just love the, write, the way she writes. But she was very clear on stage. She was like, I do not write for a catharsis. And I could have, like, shrunk in my seat, because yeah. <laughs> I was like, that is all I do. Like, I'm always trying to, like, process something on the page. I'm always trying to read something that would like edify me and give me perspective. And I'm always looking for models. We always talk so much, especially with like black women and BIPOC writers, we're always talking so much about representation. And I think it's like representation goes beyond like uh, race and, and ethnicity. It is like how to be in the world. It's like if you want to be a literary citizen, what does that look like? If you want to be an activist, what does that look like? How does how do you practice community and not just do it in theory where you're writing something, but like really showing up for people and make people feel held and um, just significant. And I, there are so many moments in my life where I did not feel that nourishment. So I can recognize it in other people, and I try to just be as open as possible. And I, I probably do it to a default, like I probably overextend myself, but when you know that feeling, you can, you can recognize it in other people and you don't want them to feel alone. With that, that point around catharsis, was there something that you felt was resolved in working through in this way? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. By the time, um, by the time I finished this and I like really was like, okay, I'm done. I sent my like last edit to my, my, um, to my editor. I just felt like the things that I was used to be so scared of, I felt like very just proud of. Like I overcame all these things, not only me, like my family, we did it together. We're the co completely on the other side. We have a different understanding of how to communicate with one another, what it means to really show up for each other in our lives, how to be just honest as possible. Like me, my family is relatively small, and you know my brothers and audience, we 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 are very honest with one another because because we know what silence can do. We know what it means to like have. Um, it, we we just understand each other in a way that like requires us to be honest all the time, because one moment of this, you know, a grudge, the silent treatment can manifest into a whole other thing. And like our family is too small for that. Like it's the three of us. <laughs> so like I, I'm always very aware of the experience my mother had. And I try, I, like I'm in therapy. I'm constantly trying to figure out like how to be my best self. And so it's a mix of reading a lot and just consuming art and being as creative as possible because that helps me. It just helps me understand who I am. And I do feel resolved as a person. I'm very like, proud of who I am despite all those experiences I had. Amazing. You should feel that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, even on a person, like a very, very personal level, beyond the Nigerian American thing, I am the oldest of three children, two younger brothers as well. Oh, yeah. Mom was a nurse, yeah, you know, so there was so many, there was just kind of a, like, oh dear God. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Some other elements that were very different, but yeah. For sure, um, it moved me and hit me in all these yeah. you know, various ways. And yeah. I just thought, thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you for sharing so deeply. And I also think like being first generation is like a <gasps> unique experience that like, um, there are not a lot of memoirs about like first generation yeah. folks. And I felt like this is like, could be a valuable model. And I really do feel like, I just keep calling it, write it into the, writing into the gaps because I was also sharing all the things I did not know. And I think that's okay. Like I think, you know, most people was like, oh, you're so young, how could you write a memoir? And I'm like, yes, that's true. I am fairly young, but I'm not writing. I feel like I have so much more oh life to live. I really focused on like this, this particular time, these moments in my life, 
And I did, I was very intentional of using the books as an anchor. So that was like every chapter starts with different books that I read and the books tied to a memory, the books tied to the memory. And that flow helped me write like endlessly because I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about books. I've read so many things and I like, I know exactly where I was when I, the first time I read Little Woman. And like, I know exactly how I felt like when I read, you know, um, oh my gosh, um, Catcher in the Rye and Hatchet, you know, like there, and those, I think those are books people are not expecting, but they did have a, a tremendous impact on how I like, I view the world. I am glad that you segued into that point because that was uh, where I wanted to go to next was mm -hmm. your format, like this structure where you were able to weave in, not even weave in, but speak to these books that were with you at these various junctures of your life, yeah. how they informed what you would do next or how you would process things that you were going through. And I have never read anything quite like this. I felt like I was both one of course reading your memoir reading your story and hearing those stories but also getting a literary review getting um like a syllabus of like all the great books that we should be reading or should have read by now and there was something so powerful about this way that you were introducing us to literature while simultaneously sharing your story so beautifully done. Oh, thank you. I, I just really wanted, because there's some key books that I feel like everyone has read. Like, for the most part, everyone has read um, William Shakespeare. You know, everyone has to read, like, Romeo and Juliet in, in school. And, you know, I, I mentioned Catcher in the Rye and Maya Angelou. Like, all those things are pretty much, you, you read those things for the most part. Um, and I had a unique experience when I was in AP English where my English teacher had some choice words about reading Maya Angelou who I adore, like he, he also changed my life and made me feel seen and he was such a great teacher. But that pivotal moment allowed me to, because his criticism allowed me to speak up for myself. Like I have no problem sharing how I feel about a situation and articulating like if I'm in a disagreement about it because of that discourse I had with my English teacher. And I don't think previously I, w I had that opportunity in school, and I think when I see everything that young people are going through, especially with banned books and you know all this like rhetoric that's happening around like what kids should or shouldn't read, it's insane. Because I, if I w if I was a kid right now, I would have so much whiplash. Like, how do you know? How do you like find your agency in that? Like, how do you formulate an opinion? How do you actually debate anything when the adults in the room are? like constantly at odds. So I think what young people need more of are spaces where they can develop their critical analysis, where they can like build their creative conviction and have like a viewpoint. Whether it's right or wrong, that doesn't matter. Like actually having, allowing young people to develop a viewpoint and nurturing that, that that's so essential and that's what Mr. Burns did for me. And so I'm like, I will be forever grateful for his, um, his teaching and just his patience with me because some of it was a little nonsensical, but still, like he just encouraged it, you know? Yeah, I love that passage in the book. I, yeah. I was glad that you were able to speak to that. And I, I'm sure many of us have had that kind of experience with huh. a teacher where, you know, we might love them or maybe there's a, a time where we're confronted with something that we think is in our gut, we know it's wrong right, or it doesn't right. sit right. But right. finding the courage of our conviction to speak up in those spaces and having heard, not all of us get that yeah. response. So to me, that really was a prelude to some of your, I don't know if you would call it activism, but it felt to me like a foreshadowing of you finding more and more of your voice yeah. and finding your way to even create a platform like Well yeah. Red Black Girl. I think I'll, you know, for me, I was, I was very fortunate, excuse me, I have like a cough. <coughs> I was very fortunate to go to Howard University, <laughs> HU, <laughs> hey. Um, Howard just like, just lights you up inside. Like you walk on that campus and you know exactly who you are. You know, like it, it is something that is, cannot be explained. My brother also went to Howard. My father went to Howard. You know, so I'm hoping Zeke will go to Howard. <laughs> you know, like I'm trying to like trying to plant the seed early. And because there is, when we say black excellence, black brilliance, there is something that happens when you walk onto the campus where you feel immediately seen and loved and understood. And, and it's like the diaspora is there. So it doesn't matter if you're from Chicago or the Caribbean 
or from St. Louis, like it doesn't matter. Like everyone there is there for the same reason. And the idea of tokenism or um, any of the isms <laughs> that you experience, it, I don't know, it just seems void on our campus. And I also just would like revel in the fact that Toni Morrison went there in Zora Neale Hurston and just like um, our future president, yes. Kamala Harris. It's a Howard University in love. Like it's, it just like you feel that. And, you, and of all the classes that I took on camp, campus, whether political or otherwise, the focus is on us. It's on like, you know, black brilliance and black politics. And like, I, I just, there's no, I, after I left that experience, I was just like, oh, like it feels like you enter a different world when you graduate. Cause you're like, oh, this is different. Like, <laughs> like I'm not the main character anymore. <laughs> like, you know, but it doesn't matter. You still feel that. So you walk in every room like you're on Howard's campus still. Like you just feel it. And it's, I really cannot articulate. It's just like a feeling. It's very intuitive. And I'm so grateful that I attended Howard because it changed my life. And I, I don't think I've been able to create Well Read Black Girl without it because what that space taught me was to, to just, you know, I, I'm never concerned about the white gaze. Like I can be in any room and feel comfortable. Um, so, but when I'm doing something, you know, sometimes when I first started, you know, people press would be like, oh, so you know, who are you doing this for, and and why, and like all these questions that just just felt ridiculous to me. It was just like I'm doing it for me and my friends, right. and like this isn't to. Yes, is that we're uplifting black culture and literature, but also we're just focused on us. It's like for us, by us. And if you are interested, I'm. Very excited, but if not, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just being on that campus just, you know, really made me feel very secure on who I was and how I showed up in the world. Oh, yes. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to read something that moved me and that kind of what I, what I think what I want to do here is I'm going to read this little passage and then we're going to turn it over to the audience um, after you respond but it was on page, and you know, I have an early edition, so maybe the same page as the current. <laughs> but it, you said this. I'd felt unloved for a very long time. There had been no room for love back home in DC. I can't, <laughs> um, yeah, okay, let me not reply. Um, at least not the kind of love that wasn't tied up in complicated things like survival and responsibility. I told my brothers that I love them all the time. I didn't want them to feel that, the way that I did, and that parroted it back to me. But there was no one in my life who ever said it to me first. I was starved for affection, and here was my father offering up what already left, oh, sorry, already felt like huge quantities of the very thing I was so hungry for. No way was I capable of passing that up. Yeah. Um, so for context, that's, um, oh my gosh, now I'm about to cry. <laughs> So when my father, um, when he decided to move back to Nigeria, I was in middle school and I didn't see him again until I was in college. So it was a, a huge gap between that time. And you know now we have Zoom and all these other things, but it wasn't, I couldn't just like FaceTime him, you know? So at the time he was in communication with my mom and writing letters and things, but I had no idea. Um, so it wasn't until Oh, I don't want to, oh, you guys haven't read yet. I'm not going to give all spoilers. I know. I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, wait a second. Um, yeah. Please continue to read the book. But it was just, it was just like a, a beautiful moment where I had been really caretaking for my brothers for a really long time. And I was finally able to see my father again after a very long time. And that idea of feeling um, not loved was very present because, I, again, I was doing a lot of the caretaking. And you, it's uh, nothing like having... The, the love and support from your, the parents, people who made you, like your parents, like you, even if you have a complicated relationship with your parents, like you want their acknowledgement, you want their love. And I had that moment coming back, like I felt like a child again. I felt like I could be like under his wing and feel taken care of. And that was a very special moment. Um, and that experience definitely influences how my parent, I'm so determined to like make space and really love my child wholeheartedly and give him creative space and play and and um, 
I grew up in more more structured, more you know, you could even say traditional Nigerian household where it wasn't you were not um, heard. You know, you were it was you had to obey and listen, and that was about it. It wasn't about being playful. Yeah. And so I tried to give as much space as possible to my son to really just feel, you know, to show up to be at places like this and. You know, so he comes to my job, and thank you, PMP, for allowing him to that. <laughs> like, he runs around in children and teens, and, you know, like, I take him places all the time. I take him to book signings and to festivals, because I just want him to see my life and be part of it and understand it and know that, like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all everything I'm doing, whether I'm writing a book or working at a bookstore. Like, I'm literally doing it all for him. Wow. <sighs> so beautiful. So, so felt, and I'm sure he knows, he feels that he's the, his, that's your legacy. He, he your likes healing all the toys. Is your legacy. <laughs> I'm not doing that to him. <laughs> um, what I wanted to also ask with that before turning it over is how did you, or how do you reconcile sharing about you know, your family in such intimate ways? And yeah. was there, how, how did you navigate that? And how oh, do yeah. you navigate that? And obviously, folks who are living or who are here, and how, how does one do that? Yeah. Well, some, some people are in the room, like yeah. my college roommate, she's in the book. <laughs> I, I maybe should ask you, like, how does it feel? <laughs> um, I, I really did. I interviewed, uh, like, the passages with my brothers. I did, I, like, I did my due diligence to really interview them and ask them for permission to, you know, to involve them. Um, and then the other, some of the other scenes, I just was very like mindful. I had my own worries around certain things where I just wouldn't go there if it wasn't out of my like perspective. Um, and then you know I added that like beautiful quote, like all these uh, passages are from my own memory <laughs> and that disclaimer at the beginning. Um, but I had like a space where I just was like interviewing myself, talking to my family, and doing my best to, especially with Zeke too. Like I just wanted him to. If he ever picked this up and read it as an adult, that he would be proud of it and he would understand it and he wouldn't be, um, he wouldn't be ashamed, you know? Like I want him to feel just like he was witnessing who I am and, you know, God forbid anything ever happened to me where, or if I went silently and wasn't able to like communicate for whatever reason, he could read this and understand who I was trying to become. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many of the books that, I've read over the years have made me feel visible and, and vibrant and alive and like that act of reading is so accessible. Um, my favorite thing is when you're like on your e-reader and everyone like underlines the same sentence. You know what I mean? Like that, that is like a feeling. Like I feel like you, everyone is just universally underlining the same quotes and like you have this like recognition of self-love and self-compassion. And I, and I wanted that in this book. Like, I hope whoever reads it can see themselves and know that the things that I overcame and survived that you can too. Oh, yes. <laughs> there was such dignity, and there is such dignity in your writing, and I appreciate that so much. All right, so we have about, I think, 10-ish minutes. <laughs> so if there are some folks who would like to ask or offers comments. We have a microphone right here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi, Glory. Hi. <laughs> um, I actually just finished the audio book this morning. I wanted to, I really wanted you to read it to me. I, I did have the arc, but I'm so glad <laughs> that I waited because I love your voice. So um, for anybody that hasn't read this book, usually I form this question for like booksellers, but I think overall this book is light and it represents you really well. So I wanted to know what would you leave us with for when you're not in the room so that we can speak your name um, in bookstores, but to our friends around the holidays, like what is something that you wanna leave us with so that we can leave the world with? Um, oh my goodness, book? that's a beautiful question. Oh my goodness, so good to see you. And maybe, if you don't mind, I'm thinking we might do one more at the same time because I there were a lot of hands. So maybe we could do two questions and then have you respond. Yeah, for sure. Mind? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of hands. Who inspired you to write this book? Okay. So I'll start with yours. So um, I will say my son for sure and all the readers in the Well-Read Black Girl Book Club. 
because I don't think without their support, their love, their encouragement, I would not have had the audacity to create this, <laughs> write this book. I was very happy with my anthology and researching other people and interviewing other people. But the, that, you know, that person who said, like, you're so happy all the time, <laughs> like, definitely planted a seed. And, like, it just made me want to be more honest about my experience and put that out there so it could hopefully help other people. And then your question, um, I, th I mean, there's a multitude of things that I would love to leave readers with. Um, that, what I was speaking to earlier, this idea of building critical analysis and engagement and helping people become literary citizens, now books can do that. And books, I, I'm not gonna say like they're therapy because that's like a big word, but I would say they do impact and um, support your emotional well-being and you can use them as such. You can read poems, you can read memoirs, you can find yourself in the pages and it can really uplift you when times are um, feel dire and also to do it in community. Like so often that we were reading books um, in solitude, there's, there's a moment where I talk about reading jazz and what that experience was like for me because I read jazz as a love story and if you are aware, there's like a murder on the first page. And so, so it is not necessarily a love story. I did not do the close reading, but like, like you need to talk to someone about it. Like I have, I have like a very clear moment where I'm talking to a girlfriend and she's like, that's not a love story. You know, like, like let's talk this out. Like, why do you think that? And my connection was self-sacrifice. There was so much self-sacrifice in that book. And that's what I, that's what I thought love was. Like when you are self-sacrificing, when you are literally dying, like you you are proving your love to someone. And so as an adult, and you know, again, through therapy, rereading jazz as with you know, with some more wisdom, with some more insight, I was able to see it in a different light. The same thing with the color purple. I reread it when the Broadway, well, excuse me, when the movie came out and I was thinking so much about motherhood. I saw Celie in a different light. Like I just saw the characters that I felt so convinced that I knew differently as I like grew up with the book. So also do like rereading. There's a beautiful backlist. Like this bookstore is filled with backlists. Read the backlist. Like, you know, we have new books every Tuesday, but the stories that like live on the shelves, go back and like sit with them and study them. And if you want to be a writer, study sentences. I really studied so many writers to like think about how I wanted to structure the book. So you maybe you can't do an MFA, but you can grab Imani Perry's book and like study every paragraph, you know? You can find other ways to be in community and find role models through literature that aren't just simply meeting the author. There's other ways to connect with them. I think there were several more hands. If you want to make yourself known. <laughs> OK. Hey, we have them back, and then we have Hi. one of prayer. <laughs> oh, hello. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Glory. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this question is more. Um, as a fellow author, and I hear this is this is your third book, I know that, but you're like, might do another one? I'm like, good God, where does she it? I need it? a break. I don't know. I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is, because if you are considering the next one, how do, what is your restorative process to write the next one? Um, because it took me a long time yes. to birth the first yes. this year. So it's like, how do you restore yourself and prepare your mind for that yeah. journey again um, when you're ready to write your next book? Oh, that's a beautiful question. And we, are we going to do one more? Yeah, let's add one more to the stack, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah thank you. I don't so much have a question as a, an, an admiration, uh, and that you opened up in talking about shame and about how when you open up and actually talk about your experience, mm -hmm. that opens you up and is so freeing. Yes. Because I think that most of us, a lot of women, but I think humanity in general it gets bound up in shame of things that when you start talking about it and thinking about it, you really had no reason to be shamed for it. And then you open it up and then now you're sharing and now we're all growing from what you thought was shame but was really just a growth for humanity. So I just want to give you props for speaking on that. Thank you so much. Oh man, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I have done a lot of work. I have, I have a strong sense of faith. 
I pray, I drink my water, <laughs> I, um, and I have a beautiful community. I definitely have people that I can call who do not care if I have written one, two, three books. They are just very real with me, and I need that type of just like honesty and people be very authentic with me. I'm a, I'm a Capricorn, so if you know what that means. <laughs> like, like I just need people to be clear. You know, I love like clear communication. Um, and when it comes to the repair, I, I think about the daily things. You know, I don't, I don't write every day. I'm not a person that, that's waking up at 5 a.m. to write. I like tend to sequester myself in a room for like 42 hours or 48 hours, 72 hours, and just like write. Um, because of just how my schedule is. But I, I think the idea of just like coming out of whatever mess of writing I am and then talking to someone about it, I also use an insane amount of voice notes. It's, like, it's just like how I organize like my thoughts for the day. It's how I organize my, my writing. And I listen back. Like if I have something that um, I'm believing God for or trying to manifest, I like say it into my phone and then I'll listen to it. You know, so I definitely have been saying I will become a New York Times bestselling author. Yes. <laughs> I've been saying that. Amen. You know? okay. And I just like I repeat things to myself all the time and just like really trying to meditate on it and think uh, thinking about the believing and the repair comes and just like slowing down and like resting and then, you know, looking to planning things to look forward to. You know, that's so essential for me. Like, I need to be like, okay, this dinner is coming or this, this travel or whatever the case may be. That also offers me just a, you know, looking into the future and gives me a sense of, like, I did it. I give myself little treats. <laughs> Beautiful. I think we have time for maybe one or two more and then we have to close it out. Okay, yes, so we have one right here. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Hi, Glory. Thank you so much for coming. You're my hero. I just want to let you know, my absolute hero. Um, I wanted to know, what three authors, dead or alive, would you invite to your dinner party? Ooh. Oh, my dinner party. Oh, this is good. Okay, so the, the first would be Toni Morrison, because I'm just like, come on now. Yes, because Toni. Miss Toni. I just want to hear all the things. I want to be at her feet. The second would probably be Unexpected. And I probably could invite him to dinner. Do you, maybe you might know him. <laughs> I re actually, he came to PMP recently. I am so obsessed with Trevor Noah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I have not met him. But I think he's just so funny. And like, it is like the one thing that I can watch with my family. And like, the, the, with my mom in particular, that she like laughs. I'm just like, oh, you're laughing at this. Like, what is this? Like, what is happening? You know, I just, I just think he's just like, and I, and I really loved his memoir. Yes. It's like so beautiful. And then the last person, um, I think it would be Ta-Nehisi Coates. Like just his, I'm absolutely admire his writing. I'm reading his latest book right now, The Message, and I think how he structures his journalism and his political activism and how he grew up. I'm also very familiar with his father, Paul Coates, who needs like a book and a documentary just on his life. Um, and the, how he just influenced Howard University. So I'm just like very, I, I admire his work greatly. And so I, I think those three people. I love that question. All right, so we do have to wrap up, but I would like to ask you one final question. Um, well, also I wanna say one thing. I loved that final chapter and the way in which you wrote that letter to Z. Oh yes, I just have to that's say my that. sweet pea, my Ziki. Oh, I, I I appreciated your willingness to diverge from the format that you were in yeah. and shift your lens yeah. and and really write to him explicitly. That yeah. was beautiful, really. Um, so yeah. you've written this beautiful book. Mm -hmm. You got a lot on your plate. Yes, <laughs> but I know that there's always more brewing with you, <laughs> and I would love for you to tell us. What is next? Yes. So um, I, during the pandemic, you know, I was having a baby and I was a little bored. And I, I reached out to, I reached out to one of my editors. And I was like, I really want to learn more about editing. And initially when we had the conversation, I was thinking more about like shadowing her. I'm like maybe I could just like shadow you, come into some of the sales calls. And it developed into a larger conversation and we developed a partnership with Live Right and Norton, where it's the well-read black girl literary series. 
And so I acquired two books last year. Yes. And they are done. They're absolutely done. They're coming out in 2025. So they've, they've, wow. the editing process, final passes, all those things have hap been happening. So one author, her name is Yarsa Daly Ward. You may be familiar with her poetry, but this is her first debut into fiction. And she has a new book called um, The Catch coming out next year in June. It's going to be fantastic. And then the other author is a DC local and a dear friend of mine, Bisret Miskevi. And she, she is absolutely like beautiful. I just cannot wait for her um, books to come out. And that's also going to be deb debuting in September of next year. So I, oh, I did a slow and steady approach. Like those of you in publishing, you know, most editors are doing like eight books at a time over, you know, you know a year, less than that. And I, I did take my time over the last like two years working on these two incredible books. Um, so I'm really proud of that. So it's coming out next year. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. I can so add cute. editor. Yeah. Yes, yeah. add editor. Then. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. We are all so proud of you. Thank you. So I love you guys. Awe. Thank you. Like, <laughs> deep bow. Yeah, thank you. So indebted to you and your work and your contribution. And I know that there's going to be a signing, and folks probably want to take photos and do all kinds of. Yeah, we can show a little music. We can yes, do a little two hello. step. You know, we can we'll turn up a little bit in PMP. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Letter cook. Anyway, anyway, okay. I don't know if anybody got that reference, but it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you yeah, for being thank here. Thank Thanks, everybody, for thank being you. here. Pick up your coffee. Thank you so much.